Hi, welcome to RCC at Home. For the past two weeks, we've been looking at this obscure verse of scripture found in the book of Job, and it speaks about a thing called a hedge of protection. If you grew up in the church world, you can probably recall going to a youth camp, before you went to the camp, before you got on the bus, the leader called you together and he prayed a prayer over you where he prayed for God to put a hedge of protection around you. We've been looking at what this hedge thing is. It's, a, it's an impenetrable barrier designed to protect you from danger. We also saw that Satan, along with the other angelic beings, both good and bad, were summoned to present themselves before God. It's in that setting that a cosmic chess game was being played out between Satan and God. And Satan there is bragging about how, how many people he's brought into his lies and rejected the reign of rule of God. So God says, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Well, as soon as God says that, Satan bites back. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, goes, God, what is wrong with you? Can't you see that the only reason Job serves you is out of self-interest? Everything he touches turns to gold. Let me throw a few temptations at him. Let me give him a couple of tests. And you watch, he'll turn on you quicker than anything from Microsoft gets invented needs to be patched. In a very short period of time, Job loses his health. He loses his wealth. He loses his family. The guy's incredibly wealthy. And the news of this falls, it just spreads like a, a wildfire throughout the land. And four of the most highly influential people of his day come to visit him. Have you noticed how people who are successful in one area of their life like to influence people in other areas of life they aren't experts in? Hey, actors can be like that. They're fantastic at pretending to be someone that they're not. And the ones that are really good at it, well, they make lots and lots of money. They become so popular at conventions, people line up and pay $30 to have a 10 second Photoshop with the guy or the girl. Many of these same actors use their influence to, to sway public opinion on politics and morality and the environment. That's despite the fact they have little knowledge or expertise with politics, morality and the environment. Well, that's what happens to Job. Eliphaz was this highly influential person. He's famous. It's just he knows very little about God's nature. And when he sees Job sitting in a pile of ashes, I want you to picture the scene. He is covered in sores, head to toe, this pus oozing out of these sores that are that's making life so miserable for him. And the poor old guy is now homeless and penniless. And Ephesus sees this and he says, Job, the reason your life has fallen apart is you have got some secret sin. We all thought you were a super holy guy, but obviously we were wrong. What's your secret sin, Job? Tell us, so hopefully when you die, God will accept you. If you see someone suffering and you don't know what to say, don't. Just be there for them. The guy's talking dribble. Job knows it, so he says, but he knows, he's talking about God, he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Job thinks he's being tested by God. And the reason he thinks that is oblivious. He's, a, he's totally oblivious to the game that's being played out in heaven. He's not being tested by God. He's being tempted by the devil. There's a massive difference between the two. Tests of our faith and obedience are part and parcel of growing in the Christian faith. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Hey, with hindsight, we know that God always intended to provide a substitute for Isaac. It's just Abraham didn't know that. The test proved once and for all that Abraham, the father of the faith, would obey God even when he didn't understand God. James, the half-brother of Jesus said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. When God brings tests to strengthen our faith and obedience, we can be sure that we're in the hands of a loving Father. These tests are specifically designed to build us up. It's the nature of God to build you up. It doesn't matter what test comes your way, God's desire is always the same. He wants you to become a better you. The tests are never designed to defeat you or destroy you. It's God's nature to empower you to pass the test. That's why he sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. 
In fact, God wants you to pass the test more than you want to pass the test. And even if you fail, He doesn't want to see you thrown in the scrape, scrape of heat of life. He wants to pick you up and brush you off and, and through failure, failure, strengthen you. I don't know about you, but I've learned a whole lot more through failure than I have from success. We serve the God of a second chance. That, by the way, is not the case with Satan. He also throws tests our way. They come in the form of trials, temptations. And like God, his tests are always designed to lead us into failure. He would like nothing more than to see your faith weakened. He wants you to dismiss those prompts you get from the Holy Spirit to reach out and help someone. He wants you to dismiss those prompts to reach out and, and give a, a sum of money to a, a noble cause that will advance the cause of the kingdom of God. He wants you to walk away from the purpose of your life so you can fill your life with despair. His plan and purpose in your life is, is to have you repeatedly given to some temptation so much, so often, that you see yourself as a hopeless hypocrite that God could never use, let alone love. With that as a background, I want to take a, a fresh look at a time when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Led by the Spirit, Jesus finds himself all alone in the Judean wilderness, barren place beyond belief, cold at night, hot in the morning, hardly anything to eat or drink. It's a bleak place, devoid of people and occupied by wild animals. And we're told that for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Now, even if Jesus' fast included eating small amounts of food, there were very few edible plants in the wilderness, and those that were there had very little nutritional value. Water is also very scarce, and even when it rains, it doesn't take that long for the water to be swallowed by the desert sands. By day 40, Jesus would have been close to the point of starvation. Can you remember a time in your life when you've pulled away from the normal activities of life? I'm talking about the watching of sport and no TV or social media. You entered into a time when it was just you and God. You prayed and you read the scriptures. And in, that, in the midst of all of that, you experienced God on a deeper level. In the month of February as a church, we're going to set aside 21 days for prayer. I invite you at that time to join with us as we experience God on a deeper level. Jesus went one step further. He didn't just pray. He denied his body food. Jesus starved his flesh to feed his spirit. I don't care how much faith you have. Fast long enough, it'll take its toll on your body. It will weaken your mind and undermine your will. And that's exactly the state that Jesus is in. And Satan comes to him with a calling card. As we saw in our first week, Satan has very limited resources. So he waits till Jesus is at the weakest point and he comes along intending to intensify Jesus' wicked state. Though wicked to the core, the devil's no dummy. He knows that his best chance of hooking victims with temptations and dragging them into sin is when they're weakened in the mind, weakened in their emotions and weakened in their will. When Satan catches us alone and in a weakened state, he can more easily get us to justify our own evil desires. He has a way of crafting his temptations in such a way that the pathway leading to temptation looks like, feels like the road to glory. He has a way of making his temptations look like, well, that's just the responsible thing to do. That is why this pandemic, we need to be on guard. This pandemic is repeatedly pushing us back into isolation. You may have won battles over your flesh when you were younger, and you thought they were nothing more than ancient history. It's just with all this extra time and all this isolation, there they are right before your face. Matthew tells us that Jesus was tempted in three areas. The first temptation related to Jesus' physical needs as a man. We're told during that time, the devil came to him and said, if, if you are the son of God, where did the devil get the idea that Jesus might be the son of God? Well, you pull back one chapter and just 41 days earlier, Jesus walked up to John the Baptist and he goes, Hey, John, I want you to baptize me. John goes, No, no, that's not right. I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. I, I can't baptize you in water. Jesus says, I don't care. You've got to do this, John. I'm setting an example for the world. Baptize me. So John baptizes Jesus. And as Jesus comes out of the water, a voice booms out of the heavens. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This makes me wonder whether Satan spent day after day hanging out with the crowds, waiting for John the Baptist to reveal who the Messiah was. 
I wonder if when Satan heard that voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, that it did more than put a shudder down his spine. I wonder if he said, I'll put this so-called son of God to the test. I notice that Satan does not tempt Jesus inside the temple, nor at his baptism, but in the wilderness when he's alone, tired and hungry. And he says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. The nature of the temptation tells us the devil thought that the potential powers of the Son of God would be remarkable. No matter how hungry, I have never been tempted to turn a rock into a hamburger bun. It's just the devil knows if Jesus was really the Son of God, as the voice from heaven stated, then such a feat would clearly be within his power. We only have a brief synopsis of the temptation. Who knows, maybe said, Satan said, hey, look how weak you are. Surely God wants you to eat some bread. He says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. You know, it seems to me that Satan's subtle suggestion had nothing to do with Jesus receiving the essential nourishments for his body needed to sustain itself. Satan's subtle suggestion was specifically designed to get Jesus to doubt the father's love for him, that the father was concerned for his physical welfare. After all, it was the spirit of God that led him to this place where there was no food, So surely Jesus had every right in the world to use his divine power and authority to meet the basic needs of life. Nothing wrong with eating bread. I'll I'll probably eat some later today. It's just the timing was wrong. Jesus wasn't in the wilderness to eat bread. He was in the wilderness to seek God and fast. At Christmas, it's just behind us. And at Christmas time, we celebrate the time when God became one of us. His name was Jesus. And in the incarnation, He gave up his unlimited, independent use of his divine power so that he could experience humanity in its fullest sense. For that reason, he would not use his power to turn turn stone into bread. Jesus didn't bat an eyelid. Without hesitation, he quotes a Bible verse back to Satan. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. As a perfect, sinless redeemer of Israel, Jesus would succeed where the nation of Israel had failed in the wilderness. He would not turn his back on his dependence on God for his very existence. Instead, he knew that God would provide for him in his timing. Having passed the first temptation, Jesus had two more awaiting him. The second temptation put the Father's love and power to the test. You know, it's insanity to try the same thing over and over and over again and to expect a different result. So Satan, he changes tact here. This time it wasn't about satisfying some physical need. This time it was about satisfying his need for approval. For this temptation, Satan took Jesus to the city of Jerusalem. There they mingled anonymously among the crowds in the temple. From there, Satan and Jesus made their way up to the highest point in the temple. There they could overlook the crowded streets of Jerusalem. It's in this setting that Satan said, if, there's that doubt word again, if you are the Son of God, jump off. If Jesus really was the Messiah, surely God would protect him from harm in front of the observing crowd below. To bolster the temptation, Satan took a feather out of Jesus' hat. He quotes two lines of a psalm, a piece of scripture. For the scripture says, he will order his angels to protect you. And they will hold you up with the hand so you won't even put your foot on a stone. The devil conveniently leaves out three words. What the psalmist actually said was, For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hand so you won't even get your foot hurt on a stone. It's thought that Moses composed this this psalm. Moses and the children of Israel had been wandering around the wilderness for a couple of years. Just they had no place to worship God. So God has commissioned Moses to build him a tabernacle. It was nothing more than a giant tent, really. As he enters this tabernacle for the first time, he is enveloped by a divine cloud, the presence of God. He has this experience of the presence of God firsthand. It was in this setting that so many people thought they were going to die from hunger in the wilderness. That Moses has a revelation that God will not allow some non-intentional accident to stop his purpose from being achieved in someone's life. In an attempt to get Jesus to perform an attention-seeking stunt, Satan takes this verse out of context. Now think about this. 
If Jesus had have gone bungee jumping without a bungee cord, it would have been the most incredible, spectacular stunt that anyone had ever seen in Jerusalem. It would have also been completely out of God's purpose for Jesus. Satan would love nothing more than he'd have to do some things that they're not a sin. Obviously, it's not a sin. But things that are still going to take you away from God's purpose and plan for your life. Once again, Jesus responds to Satan with the word of God. You must not test the Lord your God. Jesus is actually quoting Moses again. The farewell address he gave to the nation of Israel before Joshua took the reins of leadership and they entered into the promised land. And Moses is at this high point on the plains of Moab. The entire nation is there before him and he warns them against their habit of walking away from God. You see, when you walk away from God, you walk towards something else. And Jesus was not prepared to walk towards something else other than God. It's like Satan is trying to get Jesus to do the very thing that God had already warned his people not to do. In his third temptation, the devil tries to coax Jesus into worshipping him. Satan is no longer interested in being subtle or tactful. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. I'll give them to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. This is just a shortcut to what was going to happen one day anyway. In essence, Satan is saying, Jesus, I admit I don't know all the details. What I do know is going to cost you a lot to make peace between man and God. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you humanity on a golden platter. In the early part of the 19th century, there was a con man by the name of George C. Parker. He sold the Brooklyn Bridge on at least three occasions and the Statue of Liberty at least once. He would target wealthy migrants who were pouring into New York City from Europe. He got caught out when one of his rich victims tried to set up a toll booth on the Brooklyn B- B- Bridge. And that is what Satan was trying to do here. As much as the office sounds tempting, Satan is trying to sell something to Jesus that he doesn't even own. We saw last week, God alone is sovereign over the nations and that no king or kingdom or ruler can reign apart from his will. And a day is coming when God will set up his kingdom that will replace all the wicked kingdoms of this world. And while we wait for that day, we do not know that the kingdoms of this world on some level, we do know that, uh, that the kingdoms of this world on some level are under the sway of the evil one. The implication being the kingdom that Satan offered to Jesus were nothing more than the corrupt, impure and rebellious worldly empires of this present age. Jesus saw right through Satan's offer. Jesus made it clear to Satan that he was no to fall and depraved man who would sell his soul if the price was right. He was not an angelic being like the heavenly host that followed the devil in the rebellion. And he wasn't the kind of sons of God that we read in Greek and Roman mythology that can be manipulated, deceived and and tricked into carrying out our desires. No, Jesus, while fully human, is also fully divine. He's able to be tempted because of his humanity. But thanks to his divinity, he's fully empowered to conquer temptation. I love Jesus' response. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Matthew goes on to tell us that in response to Jesus' third appeal to the truth of scriptures, then the devil went away and angels came, took care of Jesus. We're not told what form of care came. I imagine they gave him something to eat and drink and I, I I imagine they encouraged him somewhat. In passing these tests, Jesus proved to the world that he was the first person in history that was qualified to be the saviour of the world. As I draw to a close, if Job was tempted to the devil, if Jesus was tempted by the devil, if the apostles were tempted by the devil, if the first century believers were tempted by the devil, it makes sense that from time to time, we too are going to be tempted. With that in mind, I want to give you four takeaway thoughts. Thought number one, Satan is a defeated enemy. So don't let him intimidate you. John, the disciple that Jesus loved, said, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ has defeated Satan, and the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in you, lives in me. That's the spirit of God Almighty. He is not some equal opposite yin-yang force wrestling with Satan in a conflict that could go either way. Satan's doom is, is sure. Every move on the chessboard of history puts Satan closer to the lake of fire. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're on the winning side, 
not because of your own strength, not because of your own power, but because of His Spirit. The second takeaway thought. Remember this. The Word of God is living and alive, so don't hesitate to use it. Hebrews says this. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. You can rely on it, so read it. Post it on a wall near where your desk is. Uh, keep it in front of you for the day so that you can meditate on it. Now, we don't do this in some superstitious way, thinking God's Word is like a good luck charm that warns off evil just by its presence. God's Word is truth, and truth has a way of setting people free. A third takeaway thought. Remember this. Jesus Christ is our first line of defense, so lean on Him, not on your own strength. Uh, the, the, the psalmist said this. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my saviour. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Jesus is a whole lot more than a historical figure that passed the test 2,000 years ago. Jesus is God in the form of flesh. He didn't just pass the test for himself. He passed it for you, and he passed it for me. On the cross, Jesus shared in our weakness so we could share in his glory and his victory in the midst of our temptation. He wants to liberate you over and over and over again. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. So ask him for grace, ask him for mercy and ask him for power. Hey, last takeaway thought. Just because you've yielded to temptation before doesn't mean you have to again. Remember what James said? Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. They're the only type of fleas I want to have. I don't know what temptation or trial you might be going through right now. But I know this, you have a choice. You have a choice of submitting to God, but that's going to require a level of humility. It will also require a level of resistance. Well, how do I do that? You call on his name, you quote his word, you claim his victory. You walk away from temptation. Unfortunately, as fallen, frail people, we have a track record of partaking instead of resisting. And we find ourselves taking steps deeper and deeper into sin and temptation. And if that ever happens to you, remember this. If we confess our sins to him, that's God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Hey, thanks for joining with me today. Let's pray. Loving Father, we want to thank you that you are the God of a second chance. I want to thank you that your grace and your mercy and peace, you're always heading it, you're always sending it our way. And I thank you that we can rise above temptation. And like Job, we can say, though I've been tested, I've come forth as gold. Lord, as you refine us and mature us, I pray you'd help us to more accurately reflect the one we serve. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us online at Runcorn Christian Church. We're continuing to grow our online presence, so please check in frequently on our website and social media platforms to stay up to date with the latest services that we have available. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video. To support the ongoing work of Runcorn Christian Church and partner in our vision, we'd like to invite you to give electronically. You can make a direct debit transfer using the account details that are on the screen and also on our webpage. Thank you again for joining us today and God bless.